Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's session, Frequently Asked Questions on Multiple Myeloma. I'm Mary Jerome, Senior Director of Medical Communications and Education at the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation. I'm joined today by Dr. Benjamin Derman and Ms. Sarah Major from the University of Chicago and their patient, Julia Grosh, a patient from Aurora, Illinois. We've invited them here today to answer some of the frequently asked questions we receive from patients and caregivers when they've received a diagnosis of multiple myeloma. So let's dive into our questions. So our first set of questions today is going to focus on the multiple myeloma precursor conditions, MGUS and smoldering myeloma. So Dr. Derman, we'll start with you. Can you tell us how it is determined if a patient has a precursor condition versus myeloma? And do these conditions always precede myeloma or, and if so, by how many months or years? Yeah, that's a, thanks for inviting us. We're, we're so happy to be here and we'll dive right in. You know, when we talk about precursor conditions um, like MGUS or MUGUS as some will call it and smoldering myeloma, these refer to states where um, a lot of the features of myeloma, a lot of the seeds that lead to myeloma are there. We can detect abnormal protein levels, usually the antibody levels that we track, same as in myeloma. But the major difference is that there aren't any end organ disease yet that we see. So in myeloma, typically the classic criteria that we talk about are the CRAB criteria, calcium being elevated, renal function, meaning that the kidney function is decreased, anemia, which means low blood counts, low red blood cell counts, and bone disease, which could be punched out lesions of the bone, which we call lytic lesions that you can just see on an x-ray or a CT scan, or sometimes an MRI, or referring to uh, actual fractures. And so those have been the, the classic criteria that define myeloma. In recent years, there's been an expansion of those criteria where they would have had the precursor condition, but there's just so much of the disease present that it's just a matter of time before they're gonna develop myeloma. And so we say, might as well treat those earlier and, mm -hmm. and get the ball rolling so that we don't run into those, those problems that we see with myeloma. So the mm -hmm. thought is that, Every patient goes through these stages, but the difference is some patients will, will know that they have the precursor condition ahead of time because of some testing or some blood work that led to that um, you know, uh, evaluation. But other times we don't know that they ever had it until we found out they had myeloma. So it's impossible for us to know when somebody transitioned to myeloma in some cases, unless we were watching it happen in front of our eyes. But typically I say that these things are going on for years, sometimes even a decade or longer before they develop into myeloma. Sarah, are there any specific side effects or symptoms that accompany a diagnosis of a myeloma precursor condition? Or to put it in a different way, how does having MGUS or monoclonal gammopathy of uncertain significance or smoldering myeloma affect a patient's quality of life? And how does it affect a patient's body? Yeah. So as Dr. Derman discussed, you know, these conditions, these precursor conditions, MGUS or smoldering myeloma, um, are a lot of times identified by changes in their blood work and um, some low level involvement in their marrow. So a lot of the times, you know, they don't really have any symptoms. They're asymptomatic. They may not know, uh, except that, you know, it's been picked up on their blood work. Um, and that's because they, we haven't gotten to that, you know, as Dr. Derman said, the end organ damage point yet that would classify them as active myeloma. So, uh, you know, a lot of times they are asymptomatic. Um, they will have to get their labs monitored periodically. So, I mean, there is a um, kind of a psychological component to that. Maybe they worry about the, you know, the disease changing or progressing, but, but otherwise they, they are typically asymptomatic. So, Dr. Derman, our patient and caregiver audience has heard on many of our webinars about a possible familial connection with MGUS and smoldering and the availability of some observational trials and testing. So in your opinion, is it necessary for immediate family members of myeloma patients to be tested for a precursor condition so that it could be caught earlier and would that be helpful? Yeah, I want to be, it's a great question. It's something that comes up a lot. Um, I think it's something Julie and I, we may have talked about as well, I recall. And, you know, the thing is, um, previously, we thought that myeloma was not at all related um, to other cancers in families. It's not something inherited or something that, you know, you'd get from mom or dad. But we're finding out that there are a small minority of cases, at least, 
that do seem to run in families. And they're not necessarily where oh, you only see myeloma. It could be other blood cancers, lymphoma, leukemia, or actually other solid cancers like breast cancer or prostate cancer. Um, so, you know, really what it comes down to is a little bit of a case by case basis. Actually, for every patient I meet, you know, number one, I'm looking at their age and seeing if, if they got myeloma earlier than expected. That might be one reason why I might be interested to know if, if maybe they have a predisposition to develop a cancer, mm -hmm. um, in particular myeloma. We think about 10% of myelomas maybe are familial. Um, but then also looking at family history and doing a deep dive, knowing about mom, dad, brothers, sisters, you know, God forbid, children who have, um, you know, cancers. And as you peel back the onion, sometimes you find there are a good number of cancers in a family and cluster. And so at University of Chicago, we do a lot of, of genetic testing of our patients um, and as a, both as a clinical and a research interest for us. Um, and, you know, the thing is, sometimes we can only find what we can look for. And part of the challenge right now with myeloma is that there may be mutations or, you know, genetic predisposition that we don't know what those things are yet. These are yet to be identified mutations. And so um, I'm always in support of research efforts to further clarify this. And so the PROMISE study is actually probably the, the furthest along where um, patients actually family members of people who have myeloma or other blood cancers, um, those who are African-American can enroll in this study, which is um, actually doing screening um, precisely what you're saying. But as, on a broad level, I think we're not there yet. We don't really understand what the implications are. And of course, you know, we may find something that we weren't looking for or even that we were looking for, but may not actually affect the patient. Mm -hmm. So I think it is a case by case basis. Certainly research is um, going to be the way to, to further answer those questions. Yes, absolutely. So I think in some of the more recent meetings that we've been to, they've been talking a lot about the iStop MM study that's going on in Iceland, where they're really screening, you know, a large proportion of people who live in Iceland for precursor conditions. And then um, I think a lot of interesting population data is going to come out of that as time goes on. There's already starting to be some really interesting data coming out of that. So um, as you mentioned, research is key in answering these questions. I mean, absolutely. And, and I think it comes down to a few factors. You know, some patients just want to know everything that's going on with their body and, and they are of the you know, mindset that they, they can handle that. But other people, you know, it causes some stress, uh, emotional distress to know that you have a precursor condition that needs to be monitored and it may not even affect you in your lifetime. And that's actually one of the things that they're investigating in the iStop MM study in Iceland. But that's looking at the broad population. Right. You know, that's a beautiful study. It's, it's going to give us tons of information. Mm -hmm. I don't know how applicable it will be to a U.S. population. Mm -hmm. um, I work in the south side of Chicago with Sarah. And, you know, um, we, we take care of a lot of African-American patients who have two to three times the rate of MGUS and smoldering myeloma and myeloma. Mm -hmm. And so... We're not sure how much of that data is going to be applicable to perhaps a U.S. population, mm -hmm. but nonetheless, these are this is really important data. Mm -hmm. Agreed, agreed. So, Julia, um, can you walk us through when you were diagnosed with multiple myeloma and how you learned you had myeloma? So, for example, what led you to go to the doctor, and uh, was it a symptom that you were experiencing, or did you have a, a strange, um, a strange result on a blood test that you had from? Uh, you know, just a routine exam? Um, well, I was diagnosed with multiple myeloma in May of 2021. I had no symptoms that I would attribute to multiple myeloma. Uh, it was, in fact, a broken bone in my right foot uh, in uh -huh. December of 2020. Uh, uh -huh. Then I broke a bone in my left foot in February of 2021 which led me to an orthopedic doctor. And he ran extensive blood work, um, making sure that there was no underlying condition. And mm -hmm. in fact, the blood did come back with some concerns, which led to further testing and then a diagnosis. Got it. So yeah, broken bones, I think is a pretty, um, a pretty, it's a presentation that's pretty common for patients when they first get diagnosed. So, although yeah. normally it's normally it's people's backs or shoulders or something. I haven't heard about a foot, so that, that's a new one. 
Yes, it was it was new to me too. So, <laughs> um, okay, Sarah, what information is important for patients and their caregivers to keep track of once their diagnosis with myeloma is confirmed? Yeah, this is a great question because when patients are first diagnosed, it can be very overwhelming. Um, they're given a lot of information very quickly. So it's helpful to, you know, have some things that, that they can focus on. Um, first of all, I just think it's important for patients and caregivers to really take their time to understand everything that's happening, be active during your visits and involved in the treatment plan. And don't be afraid to ask lots of, lots of questions because repetition is really key. It's really hard to get everything the first time you hear it. So asking questions over and over to make sure that you understand is really important. Um, and I encourage patients even to keep journals so that they can write these questions down or, or notes from the visits to really help them, you know, remember and keep track of things that are discussed. Um, also important to, to really monitor how you're feeling, your symptoms, whether you have any or not, or you develop any new symptoms or changes to your symptoms. This is very important for, for the patients and also the providers when, when they're diagnosed and starting on treatment. Um, and then also just really important to keep track of of you know helpful handouts, information on your diagnosis, the chemotherapy regimen that they you know they're they're planning to start, supportive medications. Um, it's really helpful to keep all this information somewhere that's handy, and you know you won't lose it. You'll you know have it um, um, to to you know um, pull out easily because often these things can get lost, and, and it's very helpful yeah. to keep these these pamphlets mm -hmm. handy. Um, and then obviously you know with the lab markers that we're monitoring, it's helpful for some patients to follow these, but some some aren't as interested in the labs. And, and this is really up to the providers to review these with them during their visits and, and you know, help them interpret them in a way that it makes sense to them. Um, so, you know, we do have a lot of resources that we give to our patients that explain the labs and what to look for um, and, and you know, kind of help explain to them, you know, what to monitor. And some mm -hmm. patients like to do this, but some patients just prefer to, to have us kind of explain things to them. Um, sure. And, you know, for that, you know, we can go into detail about the labs, but but that's really, I think, the, the key points, you know, for patients to really focus on when they're first diagnosed. Yeah, yeah. A lot of things to keep in mind, and this is such a complicated uh, cancer compared to some other types of cancer. And there's, at, at least, there are some easily followed lab benchmarks that help track yeah. progress, right, and help track what's going on. Um, so, Dr. Derman, speaking of complications, can you explain the process of risk assessment for a patient who is diagnosed with myeloma? So we hear the term standard risk and high risk a lot. And what do these terms mean? And I think that, that there's still some um, discussion going on about this and what exactly is high risk in the field. So, um, so tell us your, your opinion. Well, you know, if you got 10 myeloma doctors together <laughs> and you ask them to uh, weigh in on what is high risk disease, you, you, I don't know if you get 10 different answers, but you'd get, you know, three or four, that's for sure. And, and I think that reflects a little bit of the uncertainty in the field. So let's, let's just back up. So, you know, what you're talking about just with, with Sarah is really looking at, you know, usually blood markers, but we can look at three different compartments, so to speak, when we're, when we're uh, talking about myeloma. So one is, is peripheral blood, which is the blood test that we take. One is in the bone marrow, which is looking at you know, characteristics of the myeloma cells that are living in the bone marrow. That's where they like to, to go to. And then you can do imaging, which would be doing things like CT scans or PET scans or MRI, right? And those are all three different ways to really be able to keep track of the myeloma. Um, when we talk about risk assessment, we're really focused either on the peripheral blood or in the bone marrow. Um, you know, many years ago, we, um, there's a field came up with the, the international staging system called the ISS, which is a very simple and easy to perform staging system. We have three stages, one, two, and three. There's no four stages in, in myeloma world. And all it requires is two blood tests, an albumin, which is the egg white protein that's present in the blood, which is, can be low in higher risk states. And then you have beta-2 microglobulin, which is a blood test that really is not used for diagnosis, but the higher that blood test, typically the higher the stage. And even those two simple tests can actually stratify patients into three groups, those who will be more responsive to therapy and have a durable response to therapy, meaning for a long time, versus those who are likely to have multiple relapses in short succession. Since then, we've learned that 
actually the chromosomal abnormalities in the cells, in the myeloma cells, in the bone marrow can add to that as well. And this was clarified mostly in the 2000s where we found that there were a series of recurring mutations that signified patients who were likely to have early relapses. So things like if you've heard deletion 17P or swapping of chromosomal material called translocations between chromosome 4 and 14 or 14 and 16 or 14 and 20. And now recently, chromosome 1 has gained some attention in the spotlight, whether having extra copies of the long arm of chromosome 1 may be a bad, uh, a bad prognostic sign, meaning more likely to have early relapses. The way, reason it may be helpful up front is that some people, myself being one of them as a clinician, may alter the treatment recommendations based on that. You know, it might mean intensifying the induction therapy, the initial therapy we give to patients. It may mean advocating more for a stem cell transplant. It may mean more therapy after transplant, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and that continues onward. So for some doctors, they don't really use that to guide their treatment because there's not overwhelming evidence to support that changing what you do is going to change the outcome. Um, so there, that's why there's some disagreement about the utility of high-risk disease. And now, you know, we've gotten even more complicated with it where we can actually look at the genomic level and look at specific genes and say, hey, when you see this gene mutation, that means it's going to be more high risk. And so the field is evolving and the better tools that we have, the more we're going to be able to really figure out who is, is going to do really well. Now, the last thing I'll say about it is this, which is I, I you know, um, I, I've worked with some colleagues who have told me, and I, and I like this uh, phrase, that myelomas are kind of like people and they have different personalities. And, they all, and I would add that just like people, they have first impressions that, that, you, that, you, that you give off, right? And mm -hmm. so sometimes a patient may have a high risk features, which would be a kind of a bad first impression, but you find out that they responded well to treatment and everything went fine. But it also goes the other way. Patients have standard risk features, nothing that was nefarious, so to speak. And then you find out didn't really respond that way. So a lot of what we find out about the myeloma happens, you know, especially early on in those first couple of years, we're going to know, you know, what, what, you know, what we're dealing with. Right. Right. Great. That makes sense. Um, so Julia, can you tell us how you were able to become educated on multiple myeloma so that you could understand your lab reports and other aspects of your care? And I would imagine that Dr. Derman and Sarah were probably pretty instrumental in teaching you about this. Oh, yes. Um, when, after I was diagnosed and you sort of processed the whole thing, I did go to several sites um, on the web, but I didn't want to do that too much because I didn't know enough about it and I didn't want to misinterpret anything. You know, everybody, sure. as Dr. German said, everybody's disease is different. So I relied heavily on my medical team, Sarah and Dr. German, to help educate me on my particular myeloma. And um, as far as blood tests coming up, same sort of thing. Uh, I just, I didn't want to misinterpret. I didn't know what you know, the most extensive blood test I've ever had in my life is my LDL and my HDL. I know how to interpret that. All of these other blood tests, I had no clue. So I relied, I relied on them heavily uh, to help me through the whole process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is great. And I think that that really speaks to our next question. So, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll defer to Dr. Derman on that. But so I think it's, it's probably fairly important to go to a major medical healthcare center for myeloma care and talk to a specialist who's very, um, very adept at treating myeloma patients and treats a lot of them because these are the folks that are going to know the, the most about the most effective and newest treatments for patients. So, um, so, but the problem is not everybody lives near a center like that. So, Dr. German, if you're a patient who does not live within easy traveling distance to a major medical center where there's some really great myeloma specialist, can you can you get good care at at your local um, your local healthcare center? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, I mean, I, you're at, you're at, I'm a little biased, right? I I do think that you know being able to go to uh, something like an academic center or somebody who has expertise in myeloma. In fact, there's there's one study out there that um, that probably helps me keep a job, which says that you know patients who are seen at academic <laughs> medical centers for myeloma 
you know, have better outcomes. But that's, you know, that's probably a bit narrow minded, you know, of a, of a view, I, I think, of course, and, and we work with a lot of community providers in even in a big metropolitan area, where, you know, patients do um, and, and, and get really good care from their community providers, even though they're not experts in myeloma. One of the beauties of the therapies for myeloma is that they're exceedingly well tolerated by patients. They preserve quality of life. In fact, they improve quality of life. So they're, they're easy to give in the community. What I would say, though, is, you know, especially when it comes time to understanding whether, you know, something like a stem cell transplant may be beneficial, that's not something that's necessarily going to be done in a smaller center. And so, you know, you'd have to either travel or do something like that. With the advent of all of this digital engagement, right? I mean, it's been mm -hmm. a blessing. There's nothing to stop, you know, a patient from setting up a virtual visit, at least to start. And, you know, look, it doesn't maybe beat meeting somebody in person. There's a lot that gets lost, but you can get a feel for somebody's personality and, you know, for the therapeutic relationship and just get the information that you need from a trusted source. So I think sure. that's always an option. And, you know, right. your, your treating physician should have relationships with folks in, in the academic centers if, if you're in, a, you know, smaller, um, more rural or, um, you know, further away communities. Um, you should, they should have, you know, relationships with these centers to be able to provide you with that information and those contacts. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, I do agree that the ability for patients now to have virtual visits with physicians or, you know, nurse practitioners or, you know, other healthcare providers is really has been just, you know, game changing for a lot of people, which is really a great thing. If the, if the pandemic did nothing else, it did that for us. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so let's talk now about initial treatment for patients. So I'm going to start with you, Sarah, on this. So can you talk to us about what is induction therapy and how many weeks is a cycle during induction therapy and how many months on average does induction therapy last? Yes. So induction therapy typically starts with um, either a three or four drug chemotherapy regimen. Um, and this can be a combination of a few different drugs that I'm sure people have heard about already. So commonly revelmid or lenalidomide, um, it's a generic name, is used in combination with um, either bortezomib or velcade, um, uh, kyprolis or carfilzomib, and, uh, or daratumumab or uh, darzalex is the other name for that. Um, and so typically the, the which combination of these drugs to use, um, whether it be three or four and, and which medications is uh, commonly based on their, you know, risk features, as Dr. Derman had discussed previously, um, and a lot of times their, um, you know, existing chronic um, comorbidities or other medical conditions that they might have that might be affected by the, the chemo drugs that we're going to give. So um, we take all this into account when we're deciding on a treatment plan. Um, and then each cycle typically is about four weeks. Um, and we typically complete, uh, you know, about four to six cycles or so of induction chemotherapy. So it'd be about four to six months, depending on their response. Um, and then at that time, you know, we do tend to reassess the disease response. Um, and that will kind of help guide us to, you know, decide next steps, whether it be proceeding with a transplant or, you know, extended chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. So then after those four to six cycles is probably when you would um, collect stem cells, yes, right? Yes, from, yes. from patients before yes. transplant, or even if they elected to delay transplant, you would still collect cells then, right? Yeah, we try and collect cells on most patients um, either yeah. way, even if, I mean, right. if, if, you know, they're, uh, you know, a questionable transplant candidate, because it's the best time to do that. And then we have them sure. saved, saved for forever. And um, if they need it down the road. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And to tack onto that, I mean, the main reason for that is that the more chemotherapy that you receive, mm -hmm. the harder it is to collect those stem cells, specifically yeah. when it comes to lenalidomide or ravlimid. You know, that's one of the drugs where um, it's, it's a wonderful drug for treating myeloma, but it does make stem cell collection harder. And so, um, you know, waiting mm -hmm. to collect is not always a, really a great idea, even if you don't think that you want to proceed with the transplant right away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, Dr. German, and I know, I know uh, Sarah touched on this briefly during her answer to the last question, but many in our audience have heard about the results of the Griffin study. And we've been listening to this at some of the major meetings for you know a couple of years now. So comparing four drug induction regimens to three drug induction reg reg regimens, 
sorry. Um, specifically, Revlimid Velcadex with or without Darzelex added to that. So the results do show a benefit to the four drug regimen. So is this, in your opinion, now becoming a standard of care for patients who are newly diagnosed? Mm, another one where, depending on where you, who you ask, you might get different answers. Right. But I'll do exactly. my best to try to give an objective, you know, view on it. Um, I'm big on analogies. So sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Sarah is always, you know, Sarah and the patient sometimes will tell me if I'm if I'm off on them. But the analogy I would have here is, you know, like imagine the new iPhones coming out, and you know, some people are like in line first day it's out want to get that phone, want to get the new technology. They think it's going to make their life a lot better. Other people are like, I'm going to let people work out the bugs first. And then uh, if it looks good, then, you know, I'll, I'll hop on. Right. So that's kind of the situation we're in right now. We have some really mm -hmm. good preliminary data that shows that adding daratumumab or Darzlex to the standard VRD or, uh, you know, Velcade Revlimid Dex or Bortezomib Lenalidomide Dex um, extends the time, well, first of all, leads to deeper responses. And we think it's likely going to keep people alive longer without their disease progressing, which we call progression-free survival. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, the best thing to know would be two things. One is, does adding this drug up front in the beginning help you live longer and live better? And we don't have a definitive answer to that question right now. So it comes down to, for clinicians and for patients, do you want to be the early adopter or not? You know, I am one who has been an early adopter of adding Dar Dar Darzelex, Daratumumab. And part of it is that for me, it's it's two things. One, we're not, doesn't appear to me that we're adding a lot of side effects by adding the Daratumumab because it's a very, um, it's a very good drug, a very effective drug, and it doesn't cause a lot of side effects. So that's been great. Um, the other thing is, you know, I'm looking at some of the early data and thinking to myself that, you know, I, I uh, at least am, it's partly a speculative guess, right, that I think we're going to find that this regimen is going to be better for patients in the long run. Now, I'm probably going to lose the rest of my hair by the time we know that answer <laughs> definitively. But, you know, we had these same discussions about Velcade and Revlimid dexamethasone uh, compared to Revlimid and dexamethasone, right? It took many uh -huh. years. Uh -huh. um, to get that answer. And only oh, recently yeah. did we get the definitive answer, but we've been using it for a long time. And so, you know, um, bottom line is, yes, I, for me, I would say it is a standard of, of my care, but I don't think that it's wrong to necessarily um, use the three drugs. And in part, it comes down to the conversation that you have with your providers and, and see mm -hmm. what is, is right for you. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I certainly have heard different things from different folks that I've spoken to. Some people are just like, you know, anybody who's newly diagnosed gets four drugs from me, but that's not the, the across the board, you know, right. feeling from, from everyone. So you can put me to the test now. You can ask, you know, <laughs> other people on the call if that's what I do or not. <laughs> so Julia, what initial treatment did you receive? And can you tell us what you went through and, and how your care was coordinated? Um, I initially, my initial treatment was the, the three drugs. So we started with uh, uh -huh. Revlimid, dexamethasone, and uh, Velcade. And initially I was going through that. I think I only might have done one cycle of that. And Dr. German at that time had recommended maybe adding the fourth drug, Darzelex, and that it could possibly improve cleaning up my system, as he called it. Um, and so uh, then we added that. And initial, my initial treatment was, this sort of coordinates with the earlier questions, but my initial treatments were done at my local hospital, Central DuPage Hospital, who the oh, wow. oncologist there huh. worked in conjunction with University of Chicago and Dr. Derman. So my initial treatment, because you were going weekly, was extremely convenient because, sure. you know, it was 30 minutes down mm -hmm. the road. When it came to mm -hmm. uh, additional care after my initial treatment and stem cell, you know, of course, I, I went to the University of Chicago. But initially, it started with the, the third right. three drugs, and then I went to the fourth drug. Hmm. Great. Sarah? All our dexamethasone of dexamethasone. 
the zone and what are the ways that they can be managed? A lot of people have a lot of trouble with this drug. Yes, <laughs> Dex is uh, a fun drug. We have a lot of um, patients that uh, <laughs> either love or hate it. So um, on the one hand, it can provide some benefits. I mean, it can help a lot with pain, especially early on in diagnosis. Um, it can give patients some energy um, and it can help with their appetite if they have a poor appetite. But um, you know, there are a lot of negative side effects as well. Um, most commonly, patients can experience difficulty sleeping or insomnia. Um, they may have worsening fatigue as, as they kind of crash when they come off the, the dexamethasone. Um, and it can cause weight gain as well, you know, as well as increased appetite. It can cause high blood sugar levels. So this is especially, you know, important in patients with diabetes, we have to monitor them very closely when they're on dexamethasone because it can kind of wreak havoc with their blood sugar levels. So um, if they are on diabetic medications, we have to monitor that closely. And a lot of times we might need to adjust those medications or, or add on medications. Um, and then you know, other common issues are mood changes. You know, we do see a lot that can cause increased irritability, frustration, um, and significant mood swings. And, and there's some GI side effects um, that can go along with dexamethasone as well. Um, commonly abdominal pain, gas, bloating, constipation, diarrhea. Um, honestly, the best way to manage a lot of these side effects is to, you know, be be quick to adjust the dose of the dexamethasone. So mm -hmm. we do often, you know, quickly reduce the, the dexamethasone dose and, and often start on a lower dose for patients that we know might be at risk for, for you know, high blood sugar levels uh, mm -hmm. or stuff like that, because that can really make a, a big impact with patient okay. side effects. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, we can drop it down pretty low to help with that. And, and after the initial cycles, you know, it's, 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 um, quite reasonable to do that. So, um, and then, you know, we have supportive medications that we can give for, for GI side effects or, or help with sleep and stuff like that. But I think really, you know, quick dose adjustments are, are really helpful with that. Yeah. Yeah. So Dr. German, after a stem cell transplant, many of our audience hear about more treatment being given and they hear the terms consolidation and maintenance therapy. So are these the same thing? So um, great question. And, and some of this comes down to uh, semantics uh, to some extent, but yeah. think of it as, as stages when you're talking about the newly diagnosed setting. So at the beginning, we have induction therapy. We're inducing a response. You know, some people will use the term remission. Um, again, that's maybe semantics, but because we think that you know, myeloma is a, it often can come back. We don't always use the term remission. We, we say response. But either way, we induce a, a response. Then we have transplant. And, and then after transplant, we're talking about one or two different phases. Bottom line is what you're referring to is treatment that is given after transplant. For some people, my, myself being one of them, if you're giving one drug alone right after transplant, we call that maintenance therapy. And that's usually lenalidomide for most patients. When we talk about consolidation, that refers to multi, multiple drugs or multi-drug maintenance therapy. And so some patients may get daratumumab afterwards. Some patients may get, um, you know, velcate or bortezomib afterward or carfilzomib. So um, consolidation is, um, you know, referring to sometimes short, sometimes longer courses of therapy right after transplant. So for instance, the Griffin study that you mentioned, which was DARA VRD prior to transplant, patients then got two cycles of consolidation right after transplant with those same drugs. And then they continued as maintenance therapy with lenalidomide and daratumumab. And so that's an example where you have a consolidative phase and a maintenance phase as well. And those things can vary depending on, on which one that you're, you know, you're referring to. Um, so, so they are kind of the same, but you know, just that's, those are the terminology that, that we use in general. Sure. And that would be considered like, and people always ask about this too, a line of therapy, right? So induction, then you would have transplant, then you may or may not have consolidation. And then most people do have maintenance, but that's all considered to be like one line, right? Yes. The only reason that met me, it certainly doesn't feel like that to the patient, right? It feels like a, an, <laughs> yeah. an endless stream of busyness. Okay. But what it what that it really is referring to is now lines of therapy are important when we're talking about um, you know, 
uh, some of these later line therapies like CAR T cell therapy, the FDA has said you need to have four prior lines of therapy. Certain clinical trials require you to have a certain number of lines of therapy. So if you have that as counting as one line of therapy, then, you know, that's, that's why it's relevant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So, um, so along those same lines, Dr. Derman, most newly diagnosed patients are faced with the decision whether or not to have an autologous stem cell transplant as part of their care. And we know from the determination study that when to get a transplant, either as part of initial therapy or maybe after they've relapsed from initial therapy is one of the main issues um, that people think about. So is there any reason not to get a transplant following induction therapy? And are there certain situations that delaying a transplant until after relapse from that first line would be in the best interest of a patient? Oh, okay. So Mary, you're hitting all the, you're hitting all the controversial topics here, but that's good. I mean, I think, you know, these, this is a discussion that Julie and I had too. I mean, I think like a lot of it comes down to, um, the fact that, okay, so a little history here. So bortezomib Belcade was FDA approved in 2003. You have mm -hmm. lenalidomide, which was introduced in 2006, 2007, right? So mm -hmm. those are our workhorse mm -hmm. drugs, right? But they weren't around until 2003, yeah. 2006, seven, right? So if you think about that for a second, I mean, the older studies looking at whether a transplant helped or not, what, what were these patients even getting, right? I mean, these were not... Yeah. Um, these were not the same therapies that our patients are getting now. My point no. to that is that what you're seeing in the more modern day studies is that when patients get modern day contemporary therapies, like those ones that I just mentioned, um, the benefit of transplant is, is starting to slip a little bit, right? Uh -huh. It's certainly not as big of a difference as what we saw before. And when yeah, I say- sure. I mean, back in the old days, that was really all people had, right? Correct, correct. And so when I say- <laughs> When I say the, the, the differences in, in benefits, the other question is, well, what are you talking about? You already said that we should be focused on, are you living longer or living better? And um, mm -hmm. in, in the two studies that have been done, one in France, one in the United States, they looked at just giving um, the VRD chemotherapy alone for eight cycles with lenalidomide maintenance versus a transplant sandwich. So you give VRD, transplant, VRD, and then maintenance therapy. And what we found so far in both studies is that the overall survival at four, six, eight years, whatever you want to look at, is pretty similar. Meaning the number of people who are alive sit four, six, eight years out is similar. Now, some people are going to argue, hold on a minute. You know, myeloma patients are living a long time. We're talking about a decade or longer for even the average patient. So you need to wait longer in order to really see these differences. And they might be right. They might be right. Um, the, the number that we are able to look at is this number that's, I think, very difficult for patients to understand because it's of questionable benefit, which is called progression-free survival, which is not just the time that people are alive, but their disease has stayed away. The idea being that if we can keep the disease from coming back for longer, that likely means it's going to help you live longer. Um, and if we assume that that is true, then when we look at um, you know, transplant in the upfront frontline setting is so to speak, that does help the disease uh, from coming back for longer by yeah. a year or more. Yeah. So that's something that is, um, I think, important to discuss with patients. So a lot of it does come down to a more nuanced discussion. And for me, it's about meeting people, sure. in mm -hmm. particular meeting patients where they're at. Um, yes. So mm -hmm. so that's something that you really have to, to go into. And last thing I'll say is, um, somebody mentioned about a cure here for myeloma. I, I am unapologetically a believer that we can cure myeloma for some patients. And probably the best chance of doing that is getting an early deep response, that your first shot at this thing is going to be your best shot. And so what we see is that eight years out from a transplant in the French study, the IFM 2009 study, 35% of patients who got a transplant still had not had the disease come back and were alive. And that's the diff and, and the difference without transplant was down to 23%. So, you know, you could, you could look at that and say, you know, it increases your chances by 50% of a long-term, um, you know, response. And I think that's something important. Mm -hmm. Agree. I agree. So, I mean, this is, this is still, you know, greatly discussed. I mean, it just came out, 
the study just came out determination at ASCO this past year. So it's been it's been less than a year that those results were finally came out. But um, really very interesting stuff. And and we talk about this at every event, right? So everybody wants to hear about it. So um, so Sarah. Can you talk to us about how response to treatment is measured? Does it depend on the M protein level or light chain levels um, when you begin treatment? And is all this measured in the blood or is the bone marrow biopsy required too to um, assess response to a line of therapy? Yes, so um, it is a combination. So we do have the myeloma labs that we monitor in the blood. Um, and, and the main labs we're looking for there are um, what's called the, the M protein or the M spike level, um, as providers may refer to it, but it's it's measured by a protein, a serum protein electrophoresis lab or an SPEP. Um, and, and that's typically how we monitor uh, most types of disease. Um, for patients that are um, light chain disease or primarily produce light chains, we will monitor their either their kappa or lambda light chains, and this is done in the blood as well. Um, and so, you know, those patients will have elevated light chains at diagnosis, and, and we will use those to monitor throughout the course of their treatment. Um, and then, you know, it is helpful to monitor um, their immunoglobulins, which are in their blood work as well. Um, and this can be a, a way to track their myeloma, but also to, to monitor their immune system as well throughout their, their course of treatment. Um, and then we do utilize a 24-hour urine sample um, periodically to, to monitor their urine, especially for patients with light chain disease. They can have protein show up in their urine, and, and so we use this to monitor as well. Mm -hmm. um, it is important to know the baseline levels because this will help us determine, you know, response to treatment. We use that as kind of a comparison, and, and we have different um, um, response criteria that will will help us determine how much of a response they've gotten. Um, so, you know, a 50% reduction in these values would indicate a, a partial response or a PR. Um, over a 90% reduction would be a very good partial response or a VGPR. Um, and then a complete mm -hmm. re response would be, you know, without, you know, the M spike would be undetectable in the blood light chains have normalized. Um, and then, um, then what we do is, is use the bone marrow to really confirm that response. So that's really the, the best way and, the, and the, the most sensitive way to determine um, the, the remaining myeloma involvement in the marrow. Um, and that will help us determine if they have any residual disease. So if they are either MRD negative or positive, because um, that will help us classify as well if they've achieved a stringent complete response. So the stringent complete response, which is our best form of response, would be, you know, undetectable myeloma in the blood and then a negative bone marrow biopsy, an MRD negative bone marrow biopsy. Um, and then we do utilize a PET scan as well. That is helpful, especially if patients have a history of, you know, PET positive disease to really confirm that complete response. Okay. So Julia, tell us about uh, your response when you underwent your initial treatment. And I believe you opted in for a stem cell transplant. So can you tell us a little bit about your decision-making process there to undergo a transplant? And then a little bit about what the process was like. Okay. Um, my initial response to treatment was very good. I have, before transplant, I had between 5 and 7%, I think, correct, Dr. Gurren, of disease left. So it was a, a good response. And at that time, I did choose to do a, a transplant because I felt that that was the best course um, to get as much of the disease out of my body as possible and possibly have a longer positive outcome. Um, you know, so that was that was a decision. It was a, a good decision, it turns out. But prior to uh, the transplant, the transplant itself, I would say is, um, a little much, a non-event, uh, it, it, the prior to transplant is when everything kind of takes place. You go in and they harvest your stem cells, um, which is a process that's done in the hospital and, you know, a needle is put into each arm. One takes out the blood in the stem cells and puts this back in this big machine that's whirring and blood gets put back in the other arm and so that can take you know anywhere from four to six hours and and it can take one to three days so that is a, a, a bit of a process in itself you're allowed to bring people I mean my husband was with me so that was nice to pass the time and drink and eat mm -hmm. and and things like that so the initial trans or the the transplant itself is after you harvest your stem cells you go home for 
a week or so. And um, I was checked into the hospital on a Wednesday. I was given a uh, final dose of really strong chemotherapy. Uh, they gave me a rest day. And then my transplant was on the Friday after. And literally they come into your hospital room and they hang a bag or two of your stem cells and they infuse them back into your arm. And there you go. Now it's, now it's time to get started rebuilding. So yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. So, I mean, it's such a, such an involved process, right? And so we've had a lot of, it of it's, events. It's a lot. Yeah. It could be a whole session in itself, quite honestly. <laughs> Oh, definitely. Definitely. We actually had a podcast not long ago where we had, you know, four patients on talking about their stem cell transplants and one woman who had been diagnosed very young, like in her thirties, um, had had actually had two transplants. So, and it actually worked out well for her. So might've been one of your cures there, Dr. Derman. So, um, so um, we, I know we did mention a little bit on minimal residual disease. Um, so Dr. German, can you explain what minimal residual disease testing is and what the results mean uh, for patients? So to help illustrate for our audience, if a patient underwent induction therapy followed by stem cell transplant and then is currently on maintenance therapy and their MRD tests showed seven myeloma cells out of a million bone marrow cells, would you consider that to be MRD positive or negative? And what are the next steps for that patient? I know there's a lot there to unpack. So, yeah, let's spend let's spend a little time talking about that. I mean, I see some questions in the in the chat also about MRD and some results. But you know, so MRD uh, used to signify minimal residual disease. There's been a a, a slight change to call it measurable residual disease. Yeah, I've heard that. Mm -hmm. We're referring to the same thing um, in the sense that. Uh, um, Chris Horrigan, who is, does AML and, and focuses on MRD, says there's nothing minimal about minimal residual disease. And <laughs> perhaps he's right, because, you know, yeah. what we're talking about is finding low levels of cancer cells. Um, a lot of people use the iceberg analogy that by the time the iceberg is, you know, popping out of the water, there's so much that's going on underneath the surface. Um, I think of it a little differently as jumping into a pool, let's say. And on one end of the pool, it's four feet deep. And the other end of the pool, it's eight feet deep. And if I asked you to go and find something at the uh, in the pool, let's say I, I threw Sarah's keys in the car, I was mad at her. If I threw the keys to the car into the pool, I said, "Go find it." Right? If you wanted, to, if you wanted to like loaf around and look at the four feet deep, you you might get lucky. You might find it. Right? If if that's where it was hiding out, that's the equivalent of you know, sort of the low level passes that we do right now when we do a bone marrow biopsy or blood test. You know, maybe we can pick out a single abnormal myeloma cell out of thousands of cells. But MRD is referring to looking at hundreds of thousands or in some cases, millions of cells to be able to pick out the myeloma. That's like going the eight feet deep, right? And so there are different grades that we can look at. And why is this important? Well, one thing that we know for sure is that being MRD negative, meaning not having any, any detectable disease by your method of measurement seems to lead, is associated with better outcomes, longer time for your disease to, before it comes back or longer time alive as well, overall survival. Um, now, the, the reason that it's a bit controversial right now in terms of checking is that clinicians will tell me, Dr. German, I don't know what to do with that information. You know, what, so what? Somebody's MRD positive. So what? Somebody's MRD negative. What does that mean? Because they're thinking that myeloma may not be curable or they just, you know, they just, it, it's not, there's not enough information for them to change their management. Um, what we're trying to figure out as a field is, can we act upon these, these values that we get? So you mentioned, you know, somebody, it's very rare to be MRD negative prior to transplant, you know? Um, Julia mentioned that she had five to 7% disease. That's more than MRD, you know, positive. That's, that's, some, that's something where even our pathologists can look at the bone marrow slides and say that there's something there. Uh -huh. But after transplant, for, per se, you know, then it gets to be very hard to pick up anything, right? And you may see, um, you know, nothing on the bone marrow. And we used to clink our champagne glasses and say, complete response, hurrah, we're good. <laughs> but what we found out is that not all complete responses are complete, okay? Uh -huh. And so basically, patients who are MRD positive, meaning they have low level of cancer cells detected by these more sensitive measurements, 
do a do basically do about as well as those who still have detectable disease in their bone marrow at a higher level. And so what that means is maybe we should be treating patients with MRD positive. Maybe we can do more treatment, right? Maybe more treatment is going to convert them. So after transplant, for instance, maintenance therapy actually can convert some patients from positive to negative. Um, at a clip, depends on what you look at, but anywhere from 10 to, to 40%, depending on the study you look at. Mm -hmm. And even in the second year of maintenance, that can happen as well, right? So these are things that, that we look at for sure. Um, the trend is important too, right? Somebody may have a low levels of cancer cells, let's say it's 100, but if it goes down to 30 in over a year, that's a good sign, right? So a downward trend is also good. Getting to, com to zero complete negativity to me is a prerequisite for potentially saying that someone may be cured. It doesn't mean just because you do it once you're cured, but seeing it consistently over time may uh -huh. be the case. And ultimately, when we talk about discontinuing treatment per se, to me, that's something where we might be able to do that. I'm running a trial right now where we're actually trying to answer that very question. So I don't advocate you know, stopping treatment right now just because you're MRD negative, but I mean to say that it could be a sign that we could do that and knowing that information is helpful. But when somebody has low levels, like seven, let's say, right, we would call that MRD positive at the 10 to the minus six level because there are seven cells per million, okay? So we could detect something between one and 10 million, one in 10 per million. Mm -hmm. 10 to the minus fifth refers to detecting, you know, anywhere between 10 and 99 cells per million. So you know, there are these different grades um, that we can look at. And basically, the lower the number, the better. Mm -hmm. And if we see increasing numbers, that typically is going to tell us that the disease is going to be coming back soon. So I hope that that helps clarify a little bit. Yeah, I think so. So thank you. Okay, so um, in the time we have left, let's touch a little bit on side effects and also um, a couple of other issues. So Sarah, I'm gonna start with you on this. Sometimes patients have other chronic health conditions along with their multiple myeloma. And I, we already talked about patients who may have diabetes and the effects that dexamethasone may have on people who have that disease. Um, patients also might have autoimmune diseases like lupus or rheumatoid arthritis. So how do separate health conditions like these affect a patient's eligibility for a stem cell transplant or what drugs might be used in their therapy? Yeah, so certainly, you know, we take all these other factors into account when we're, you know, deciding what initial therapy to use um, and then ultimately, you know, whether they will be transplant eligible. Um, you know, and, and an important factor too is, is how well some of these conditions are currently controlled and managed um, uh, and then, you know, to help us guide our, our decisions. Um, so, you know, some examples, patients with pre-existing neuropathy, you know, we are very hesitant to and try to avoid to use bortezomib or Velcade in those patients because um, we don't, we know that could make the, that worse. Um, and then patients with, you know, cardiac conditions, um, you know, it will have to be careful with how we use or if we use carfilzomib or kyprolis because that can have some, some cardiac side effects. Um, not to say that, you know, it, depending on the condition, we still might be able to use it, but we'll just need to be monitored closely or, or adjust at lower doses. Um, and then for transplant eligibility, you know, we do take into account the severity and, and the number of other chronic health conditions that they have. And, and what we use actually to help with this is our transplant optimization clinic or our top clinic, as we call it. Um, so patients with a lot of comorbidities will send to this clinic and, and older patients to kind of get a, a risk assessment and, and, and a way that they can recommend if, if patients can be optimized potentially for transplant and, and how um, and or if, you know, a transplant is, is recommended or not. And this really helps guide us, you know, with these patients with more uh, complex chronic, you know, uh, right. me medical conditions. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, okay, so Sarah and Dr. Derman, I'm going to give you a series of side effects and symptoms questions that we've received from patients. So this is kind of like the rapid fire part of our program. So, um, so I'd like you both to weigh in on some answers. So first of all, do any myeloma treatments cause memory loss? And Dr. Derman, I'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, typically we think of um, lenalidomide or pomalidomide which may be associated with memory loss. It's always hard to know definitively. I never really make a clear diagnosis of that. In fact, you know, I treat a lot of older adults, so 
some of, of this may right. be related to, to aging. No one take offense, okay? I just I'm just <laughs> bitten facts, okay? But but that is something that we have to to keep in mind. Absolutely, Sarah. Do you agree? Yes, yes, I agree. Yeah. Okay. Um, Okay, so and and so Sarah, you were talking about peripheral uh, peripheral neuropathy with Velcade, right? So, which yeah. is damage to the nerves, and you know, patients really find this very disturbing when they have these symptoms. And I think that a lot of people just they have it, but either they don't report it, or there really just isn't much that you can do about it. But so, so does this type of damage, like this neuropathy, does it also affect uh, the sensation of taste? Um, you know, it can. I would say, though, that's not typically the, the, the most common form that we see with the Velcade. Um, I mean, uh -huh. a lot of times it's, it's simple, you know, sensation changes in the feet or the hands, or they might even just, you know, not really know how to, to describe that sensation. Um, not to say that it, it can't cause some taste changes or, you know, um, some, some changes in their taste sensation. Um, but I would say more commonly, it's, it's more the peripheral neuropathy that we see. Yeah. So which is more really like in the toes and, and yeah. fingers. Right? Yeah. So yeah. certainly after a stem cell transplant, yes. you may have, um, you know, a loss of taste for a period yes. of time. And, that, and that's mm -hmm. related to the chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. So um, and there's also um, myeloma patients who experience pain. And there's a lot of discussion um, in myeloma patients about the pain that they feel. So, and what is the, the cause of that pain? We had one patient write in that they've been a patient for 15 months and they've never experienced any pain. And then you talk to some other patients who have experienced terrible pain. Um, and I think they want whether if they have no pain, they want to know whether that's a good sign or not. And I think that, um, you know, in general, pain is how, how myeloma is diagnosed very frequently. And that can be related to, um, to broken bones or some other things. So, um, so Dr. Derman, talk to us about pain. Yeah, I mean, some, some of it comes down to, again, the, the personality of the myeloma. Some myelomas typically affect the bones more, others affect the kidneys more or something else. Mm -hmm. Some people are diagnosed simply based on lab work and a bone marrow biopsy. And so, you know, they're, they're essentially asymptomatic. Um, you know, so I, I, it, it doesn't necessarily mean a good thing or a bad thing if you have pain. Of course, the, the thing that we don't, we, don't, we don't want people to be in pain and if they have significant bone diseases, they're at risk for fractures. So that might be a sign that, that they fractured something. But, but pain in itself is not a, you know, a good or a bad sign from a prognosis standpoint. I will say that, um, you know, in the, it takes about two months. I often tell patients, give us two months and you're going to be a completely different person by the time that, you know, from the time that we start therapy, if they're in a lot of pain. And, and oftentimes you'll notice that the, that pain just really dissipates because you're killing cancer cells during that time. You're getting rid of the myeloma, which is, mm -hmm. you know, gotten itself into the bone, causing these issues. But there is a period, especially in the first couple of weeks of therapy, where people are actually maybe at a slightly increased risk of, of fractures. Um, and that's something that, you know, you're not always out of the woods right after you start therapy. But if you give yourself about two, two months or so, it, it'd be a completely different situation. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and along those same lines, you know, a lot of times patients want to exercise after they start to feel better, right? So at what point during therapy or after therapy is free to be able to exercise? So for example, go hiking, go biking, run, play tennis, et cetera, and feel confident that their bones won't break. Is there a off, Sarah? Yeah. So, you know, we do throughout their treatment course, we, we do educate them that they do have to continue to be careful even after the initial phase of treatment with regards to, you know, more higher impact activities. Um, and we do put a weight restriction typically of 10 um, pounds for our patients to Sorry. avoid. Oh, can, you, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear okay. you fine. So. <laughs> um, you know, to, to prevent, because they still yes. do, will be at risk for fracture, but we do also encourage our patients, uh, you know, to, to do some um, daily activity. And, and as they go through their chemo regimen and they start to, to know how they, they feel and, and if they'll be able to kind of, you know, perform certain activities, we do encourage them to slowly increase um, their activity, ideally with, you know, lightweight um, or um, like, 
uh, low impact activities such as walking. Um, and, and this will depend too on what they did before their diagnosis. So their physical state, you know, um, what their, what their um, typical activities were. Um, so we still advise them to be cautious throughout, but we do encourage, you know, activity as well. Yeah, I, I, I echo those sentiments exactly. I mean, I, I know we're, we're running up against time, but I, I wanted to just say, you know, Julia is, is a patient, for example, who's always been very active. I, I know from our interactions and those were frequent discussions with us. I mean, Julia, when did you feel like you could be yourself again in terms of your activity level? At what point did you feel like you were at that point? Um, I, I, I came home and probably two or three weeks after, two weeks after, I started um, doing some low impact. Uh, I would hit the bicycle and I would, my goal would be 10 minutes and then the next day would be 15. Continued to lift weights and uh, my, my regimen, I felt very comfortable doing most everything that I normally did in the past after my transplant. Um, so I, I'm back to my normal activities constantly and weightlifting. And so I not good. Everything is going well. Great. So um, it is a little past the top of the hour and we are having technical difficulties. I had to turn off my grand piano there. So I'm hoping that that's helping a little bit. But um, so on behalf of the MMRF, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. German and Sarah Major and also um, Julie Grosch for joining me today. We had a great discussion. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank everyone who's listening to our presentation today and sorry for technical difficulties. Um, and I'd also like to thank our sponsors for this program, Adaptive Biotechnologies, Bristol Myers Squibb, Genentech, uh, GSK, Janssen, Carrier Farm Therapeutics, and Takeda for their sponsorship of this session. If you have additional questions about what you heard today, please do not hesitate to call our MMRF Patient Navigation Center. Um, and their number is 1-888-841-6673. Thank you and uh, have a great rest of your day.